Hello, and thank you for joining the MVMA for its sixth installment of COVID-19 webinar updates with today's speaker, Dr. Sarah Lim. I'm Nicole Cass, CE Program Manager with the MVMA and today's moderator. It's great to see so many familiar faces joining us, um, but for those of you who are new, a few reminders before we get started. If you have only called in via the phone and did not log in online, you will not be eligible for CE credits. This is because you only appear as a number and not a name, and I have no way to verify who called. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A area. All questions will be held until the end. As I mentioned today, we have joining us Dr. Sarah Lim, who is an infectious disease physician with the Minnesota Department of Health, currently working on her master's in public health in epidemiology. Go ahead, Dr. Lim. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, I'm new to the Department of Health. I'm an infectious disease physician by training, um, and I joined about a month ago. I've mostly been helping with the COVID response, um, helping to write uh, guidelines and uh, clinical communiques with uh, uh, providers. Um, so what I, I'm just going to see if I can advance my slide. There we go. So what I, and I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'd like to do sort of a high level overview of where we are um, with the pandemic. I thought the way that I would structure this is to talk about uh, a timeline of the pandemic from the very first day up until um, early March when the World Health Organization finally declared it uh, to be a pandemic. And I'm going to use that kind of as a jumping off point along the way to talk about some different um, topics like coronaviruses in general, the clinical features of COVID-19, uh, the testing that we're currently doing for SARS-CoV-2 and some of the limitations of those, um, some quick points about uh, transmission, the r uh PPE versus source control, kind of some of the hot topics that have been um, featured about this, and then um, I want to make sure I have some time at the end to go through um, kind of a situation update for where we are in Minnesota, including um, case updates and uh, some details about the models um, that the governor um, publicized about a week ago um, that, uh, that he and other policymakers have been using as they uh, make decisions about how, uh, how we manage it here in, uh, in Minnesota. So. So this is the global situation as of this morning, and I'm sure everybody's fairly familiar with the Johns Hopkins dashboard now. So as of 9.30 this morning, we were at over 2 million cases worldwide with uh, nearly 140,000 deaths. And unfortunately, the US is still the leader in terms of raw case numbers. We're far and away ahead of other countries that saw cases before us, like Spain, Italy, China and so on. Uh, some uh, some Asian countries that um, saw relatively low case numbers at the beginning because of their mitigation efforts, like uh, Singapore and South Korea, are now um, starting to slowly see an increase in cases again. And the concern there is that these are travel-related cases; that uh, cases are being re-imported back from some of the other hotspots around the world. So. We're not sure going forward what will um, what's going to happen with those, and it has implications for what might happen as we come out of sort of a lockdown scenario and start quote unquote opening up the country again. So here's day one of the pandemic. Uh, the first official reports that something was amiss, um, December 31st of last year. So the virus had almost certainly been circulating for at least six weeks before that based on uh, phylogenetic analysis. And the very first case in retrospect that was identified, the sort of index case, quote unquote, was a, a gentleman who I believe started having symptoms around the beginning of December. But uh, the last day of December, when there was the first official reports from China that there was an outbreak of an unknown pneumonia in the city of Wuhan. Um, and Wuhan obviously now is a lot more famous worldwide than before, but Wuhan um, was the, or is the capital city of Hubei province, and it's a huge city. It's 
greater than uh, 11 million people, which is larger than New York City. And it's a major manufacturing and transportation hub. So there are multiple high-speed trains and flights leaving on a daily basis going all over China and flights uh, internationally as well. So it's a huge, huge hub. And the first, um, the first outbreak report was that there were 27 cases um, hospitalized. Seven of them were in critical condition. And initially, it's, uh, there were reports that cases were linked to a seafood market, um, about two thirds of them. So not all, but a significant number. Um, and this market was a wet market that sold um, not only seafood, but also live animals, um, as well as by report, um, exotic animals that were likely illegal to be, uh, to be trading in. I've read everything from wolf puppies to ostriches. Um, and the patients were in isolation. Uh, the cause was unknown, but looked like a viral pneumonia. And the initial rumors were that it was a, a SARS outbreak. And the market was closed very quickly once the outbreak was reported um, the following day. So this is the market, uh, Huanan uh, Seafood Market, which is now fairly notorious worldwide. Um, it was the largest seafood wholesale market in central China and sold uh, seafood like crab and shrimp, but also wild animals. And reporting sort of after the fact were, was that conditions there were fairly unsanitary. Um, there were reports of animals being slaughtered and skinned sort of right there with uh, carcasses uh, hanging up. You can see that in some of the pictures, if you Google it. Um, this, red circle here was someone, this was just before the market was closed and someone, oops, Daisy. Someone was uh, trying to cover up the word wild, shop name. Um, and I will say it hasn't been conclusively uh, determined that the um, virus originated in this market. Um, there have been concerns for a long time about these wet markets acting as a potential spillover point for um, zoonotic viruses. Um, particularly, there's been concerns about it in terms of influenza. Um, you'll see I have a picture on the next slide. You can see that in a lot of these places, you get animals caged together, you know, in very close proximity to each other. And when you have animals mixing like that, um, it is a potential point for viruses to jump species. Um, particularly for influenza, um, you see this in pigs. Um, there are avian strains of influenza, human strains, and pig strains. And pigs can be infected with all three. So um, they act as sort of the perfect um, mixing bowl for viruses to undergo reassortment and then potentially jump into humans. So if you look at these pictures here, the top left there is a civet cat. And this was uh, initially theorized to be the reservoir for SARS. Um, they later determined that it was um, bats who were the natural reservoir and the civet, uh, the palm civets were likely uh, an intermediate host. So the virus jumped from bats into the civet cats and then into humans. And then down on the bottom left, you have the pangolin who, um, again, it hasn't been uh, conclusively proven, but the theory is that pangolins may have acted as the intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2 um, or COVID-19. Um, the middle picture there, um, there's a deer on the bottom. I actually have seen this picture multiple times and I've not been able to identify what type of animal that is on the top. So I'm actually hoping somebody listening to this webinar might be able to tell me. And the picture on the bottom right, um, caused a great deal of uh, consternation when it, I think it came out on Twitter again, there was speculation that koalas were being sold in the market because where that little red circle is uh, apparently red tree bear in Chinese, and that means koala in Singapore and Hong Kong, but apparently in China, it just means large rodent. So I don't believe that they were actually selling koalas. So here's the first two weeks of the pandemic. And the first week, the case count increased to 59, but there still wasn't any clear evidence of human to human transmission. Uh, and again, a lot of cases were linked to the seafood market, but not all. CDC issued a level one travel watch 
which uh, essentially meant if you go to Wuhan, don't interact with any animals or any sick people, but wasn't any more restrictive than that. They ruled out SARS and MERS, and then interestingly, Hong Kong, which was um, one of the hotspots for SARS back in 2002, 2003, they acted pretty quickly and started to uh, flag sick travelers who were coming from Wuhan and isolating them. And actually, pretty quickly, the respirators, N95 respirators started selling pretty fast in Hong Kong for two or three times their normal price. So, you know, I feel like they had kind of seen this story before and wanted to be proactive. And then in the second week, um, a novel coronavirus was identified. So this was the first indication that we were dealing with a novel pathogen, not something that we had seen before. And uh, the genetic sequence was published within that week, uh, allowing CDC and WHO to start working on a test using those genetic sequences. And then the very first death was also in that week, as well as the first case outside of China and a woman who had traveled to Thailand. So let me just stop and say, what are the coronaviruses? So these viruses are pretty common in animals as well as in humans. Um, we have sort of known about them since at least the 1960s. Um, they're large round viruses, um, single-stranded RNA. Um, and they're made up of different proteins. There's the nucleocapsid protein, which is N, which sort of wraps the, uh, the RNA. You've got the E envelope protein and the M protein, and those are involved in assembling virion. And then the spike protein is what gives it that distinctive appearance. It looks like, people say it looks like a crown, hence corona. And that's what mediates the, uh, that's what allows the virus to actually gain entry into host cells. Um, and there are some different subtypes of coronavirus. Um, they're divided up into alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And the alpha and the beta typically affect, infect uh, mammals. Gamma viruses, mostly avian, and then delta can infect mammals uh, and avians. And so these four are the, were the first known human coronaviruses that essentially cause the common cold. So these are the community acquired respiratory coronaviruses. Uh, then SARS, which was identified in 2003, uh, sorry, 2002, is a beta coronavirus, um, as well as MERS, which was first identified in 2012. And then uh, SARS-CoV-2 would fit into the same um, kind of uh, played there as the human SARS coronavirus. It's also a beta coronavirus and probably originated in bats. So this diagram sort of shows you the, the main viruses that we just mentioned and where they came from. So you can see that for the most part, their natural hosts are bats, but then uh, some of them go through an intermediate host. Um, for those top four, the kind of for you know, want of a better word, the common cold coronaviruses. Um, one of them probably has its reservoir in rodents and goes through cows. Um, SARS was thought to have originated in bats initially, jumped to the uh, palm civet and then into humans. Whereas MERS, um, and that was probably pr fairly recent um, for SARS. Whereas for MERS, the thought is, is that the MERS likely originated in bats, but jumped into camels about 30 years ago. And since then, the camel has really been uh, the main human reservoir for MERS. And that last one down there at the bottom is actually uh, swine acute diarrhea coronavirus, which um, apparently infects piglets. Um, I don't believe there's any uh, evidence of any infection uh, in humans. Okay. So SARS, um, just to go over it briefly, SARS originated, uh, SARS, the SARS outbreak um, began in November of 2002. Um, the epicenter was also in China, in Guangdong province, and then it spread to Hong Kong, Vietnam, Singapore, and Canada uh, fairly rapidly. Um, it peaked around March and then was essentially brought under control with 
contact tracing and infection prevention efforts around July of 2003. And since then, there, there have been a couple of isolated cases and clusters, um, a couple of which have been linked to um, lab workers, but there haven't been any cases of SARS since mid-2004. Um, it caused over 8,000 cases and 774 deaths with um, sort of a, a similar clinical yeah. picture to what we've seen in COVID um, with an acute respiratory distress syndrome and a viral pneumonia. Um, and the difference between SARS, we'll say SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV, which is what we have now, uh, the reason that we were able to bring SARS under control, and we haven't been able to do that so far with SARS-CoV-2, um, is not related to the um, transmission per se, the r naught for SARS was, is likely higher than for SARS-CoV-2, but uh, people with SARS didn't become infectious until around day four or five of symptoms, whereas with SARS-CoV-2, it's likely that people are uh, infectious and transmitting virus for a day or two before they develop symptoms. So for SARS, once you found someone who was a contact, if you isolated them before they developed symptoms, you could stop transmission, which is, and that's different to um, what's been going on now with COVID-19. Uh, and then this is MERS. Um, MERS, the cases were in Saudi Arabia in 2012. Um, you can see, there, is, there still is, every year there are cases and clusters. Um, so far, it has mostly affected the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Northern Africa, and India, um, with the occasional travel-related cases in Europe and the US. Uh, so far, uh, it has caused nearly 2,500 cases and 858 deaths. And um, it does have a higher case fatality rate, um, which I should have said on the previous slide, Case fatality rate with SARS was about 10%, which is um, higher than with COVID-19. MERS, higher again with a case fatality rate of about 35%. But luckily, MERS has not been, uh, so far, hasn't been uh, really as transmissible as SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV-2. Um, and again, camels are really thought to be the, uh, the main reservoir for human infection, which is why we've seen for the most part, we've seen cases really limited to areas where uh, where where camels would be um, typically found. So then SARS-CoV-2 um, provisionally was named 2019 novel coronavirus uh, when it was first identified, and its genetic code is extremely similar to a bat coronavirus, which is why the thinking is or that bats uh, are the likely source. The question is simply whether the virus jumped directly from bat to human or through an intermediary species like the pangolin. It's, uh, there's very little genetic diversity. It's, it's likely been circulating in humans for a very short period of time. Uh, it enters cells by binding to the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, um, which is why if anybody is on antihypertensive medications like ACE inhibitors or ARBs, they raised about whether those are uh, protective or a risk factor for severe disease. Those have, that has not been borne out yet um, with, um, with what we know so far. Um, and it formally got its, uh, you know, its proper name, SARS-CoV-2, on February 11th. So back to the pandemic and where we are. So this is, again, this is only week three, but already our cases in countries outside China. Um, and this really, the way that this pandemic has moved, especially in the early stages, really shows you what happens with modern travel, with how interconnected everybody in the world is, how quickly a virus can spread from its epicenter around the world. So back when it took three months on a ship to get anywhere, if you had an infection on board with an incubation time of a week, by the time you reached your destination, it would likely have burned through anybody who was susceptible and then died out. Whereas now you can get on a plane and you can be on another continent in a matter of hours. So it's, you can see how quickly viruses can spread. 
So this week in middle, the middle of January is when um, human to human transmission was first confirmed by finding cases in other areas of China that did not uh, initially or had a contact maybe, but those cases had not been to the epicenter of Wuhan and healthcare workers were also developing infection. And January 21st was when the US reported its first case in Washington state. Uh, the following week at the end of January um, was when uh, China initiated its infamous uh, lockdown in Hubei province, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide, but uh, was really unprecedented in terms of a public health, health uh, intervention. Uh, the CDC did raise its travel warning to the highest level, um, and Singapore and Vietnam started to see cases. So the lockdown was really, and there was a lot of skepticism at the time from uh, entities like the WHO and public health experts about how well this would work. Um, they did announce it a day or two ahead of time and about 5 million people actually left the area that was to be um, quarantined. So people questioned really how effective it was going to be, but it actually, it, it turns out that it, at least in the short term, um, has been pretty effective. Um, it, there were about 60 million people within the area and um, all public transportation was shut down, all non-essential businesses were closed, schools were closed, and only one person from each household was actually permitted to go outside to get food once every two days, uh, with the only exceptions being to go to seek medical care. So you can imagine what it would be like to try to implement something like that, say in a country like this. Um, and many other countries uh, have since initiated similar types of closing down of the economy, you know, like we've done here, but not in, not in quite uh, as draconian a way as China did. Um, and these are some pictures from a colleague of mine here um, with, these are sort of, I guess, maybe we call them propaganda, but, you know, posters that went up around Wuhan, uh, the Chinese authorities were kind of trying to sell this as uh, we are at war with the virus. So they would put up things like, how much pension you will receive depends on how much you go out. Uh, you're a piece of garbage if you go out without wearing a mask. Um, I'll break your legs if you insist on going out. Uh, just very interesting. So then back to the pandemic. Uh, again, we're only a month in, and now the outbreak is nearly 2,000 cases, 56 deaths. Um, China. Uh, has taken steps to ban the, the trade, at least as far as I know, in uh, exotic animals. Um, I am not sure what sort of measures are being taken to potentially regulate uh, the wet markets, um, but I think with the amount of attention that's been focused on it as a result of this pandemic, um, they, may be, they may have no choice but to try to take um, some stronger regulatory action. Um, and the end of January was when uh, a team from Hong Kong, uh, who were well versed in pandemics, particularly with SARS, uh, estimated using their modeling that the true numbers of infections probably were at least 10 times higher than the official reports and forecast that the numbers would continue to increase exponentially and would probably peak in late April or May. Um, and so far, I don't think that they have been proven wrong. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the clinical features of COVID-19 uh, in humans. So I think if anybody, anybody wants to go have a, a bathroom break or grab coffee, this might be a good time. But for anybody that's interested in what COVID-19 is like in, uh, uh, as a human disease, um, most of what we know about it so far has actually been re uh, relatively consistent from the initial reports in China to what we're seeing now here in the US, uh, the incubation period. Uh, is about four to five days in general. Uh, the symptoms are really an influenza-like illness, so it's um, uh, difficult to tell uh, whether this might be influenza versus uh, a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and the spectrum of illness that we're seeing um, has been pretty consistent as well. The vast majority of people have either no symptoms or what seems like an uncomplicated sort of URI type picture. Um, or may have um, more clinical evidence of pneumonia, but no respiratory distress or oxygen requirement. But about 14% of people uh, do have more severe illness and would require hospitalization. 
and then about 5% of more critical illness and uh, uh, end up in the, uh, the ICU. And what they've seen in the hospitals uh, is hospitalized patients is that there's often this biphasic pattern to the illness where people are relatively stable for the first week and then um, seem to develop a, a cytokine storm with this very exuberant pro-inflammatory response that uh, causes a lot of end organ damage. So people just tend to just deteriorate really rapidly. And uh, the case fatality rate um, uh, really seems to depend on comorbidities and age. So overall, the case fatality rate has been about 1% or just over 1% in the US. But um, as you start going up in age, um, over about 50, it goes up to about 4% and up to um, about 8% in those who are over 80. And in terms of the comorbidities, it does seem like if you have certain underlying medical conditions, you are at a higher risk for having severe illness uh, and death. And CDC, looking at a smaller subsample of the numbers that they have for hospitalized cases here in the US, they found that uh, about half of people have had uh, hypertension. So whether that's an independent predictor of badness or if it's just that you tend to see it more with obesity and diabetes is up for debate. About a third have had chronic lung disease like asthma. And then about a half of people have had um, obesity, especially in the younger age groups and uh, poorly controlled diabetes too in about a quarter. And then this is the CT appearance of COVID-19 and it doesn't project terribly well, I apologize for that, but this is the typical picture where you see these brown glass opacities, um, which are tend to be located around the periphery, which is unusual for uh, this type of uh, appearance. Typically, if you had a viral pneumonia with brown glass opacities, You'd see it more diffusely, but these are, these are really around the edges. And this kind of looks like what SARS looked like, interestingly enough. Um, this is just another picture showing you that sometimes they can look almost like uh, nodules. And then uh, for treatment, we don't really have um, a really uh, evidence based good treatment. A lot of this is experimental. Uh, and a lot of this is supportive with um, oxygen and various ways of improving oxygenation and delivering oxygen. Uh, in terms of infection prevention, these high flow nasal cannulae are probably better than uh, something like a CPAP mask because of the possibility of aerosolizing virus out into the room. Um, people have been ventilated in a prone position, which um, sort of helps open up the posterior and basal segments of the lung and improves oxygenation. And um, there have been, I'm not going to say too much about therapeutics because there's um, we don't really have any really good evidence-based treatments yet. Um, people have been trying lots of different things. Uh, remdesivir is an antiviral that was first developed for Ebola. Um, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine is a thromycin issue, which has been pushed by the president. Um, so far, uh, there is no good conclusive evidence that it works, and there are some major concerns about side effects. Um, tocilizumab is an IL-6 blocker, so it's, uh, it's used to block one of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, that's been promising, but very, very small case studies and not randomized controlled trials. And then convalescent plasma has actually been used a lot in China and is here. Uh, the Mayo Clinic, I believe, is actually running a randomized controlled trial where they take plasma with uh, antibodies from people who have had COVID-19 covered and use them as a therapeutic. So those studies are going on. Then, uh, so doubling back to the pandemic, um, by week five, which was end of January, beginning of February, we first found a human to human transmission in the US. And uh, this was when uh, the Trump administration declared that they were blocking travel from China. Now, the argument at the time was that this really wasn't going to be of much use when the US already had cases and we were already seeing human to human transmission. Plus, this was not a complete ban. And about 40,000 people from China still came into the US over the following two months. So the efficacy of that measure is, is very debatable. Uh, and overall, the total pandemic was now over 20,000 cases. 
So the R0 for COVID-19 at this point in the pandemic was estimated to be at 2.2. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the R0 and what that is. It's the basic reproductive number. It's a term that's used in epidemiology, and it's the average number of new cases that result from one contagious person. And it's calculated using uh, formulas that take into account number of contacts with people and how long you're infectious and the attack rate. And if the R0 is less than zero, the epidemic will die out over time, whereas if it's greater than one, uh, I'm sorry, that should actually be R less than one, not less than zero. But um, if it's greater than one, then the epidemic expands. And the important note is that the R0 isn't something that's um, fixed and, and unchanged. Um, you can intervene on the R0 with different measures that you take. So the R0 only applies when you have a fully susceptible population. If you have no one who is immune and no one who has been vaccinated, and you have no way to control the spread of the disease, then you have the R0, which is what it is. But if you could take someone who had, say, SARS, where the R0 was definitely higher than SARS-CoV-2, about maybe three or four, if you put that person into an isolation room and had healthcare workers going in wearing full PPE and um, didn't allow anybody else in, the R0 clearly is going to go down. The average number of infections resulting from that person should hopefully be zero. So these control measures like uh, vaccines, isolation, PPE, social distancing, all of those can affect uh, the R0. So then in mid-February, or sorry, early to mid-February, the pandemic continued to expand and was over 43,000 cases now. Uh, this question of whether the virus would go away in April um, was brought up, and I think this was based on hopes that it would be like the flu, but the only reason that SARS was brought under control in July of 2003 was not because it got warmer, it was because of infection control measures, and MERS has been happily transmitting to humans in Saudi Arabia for years where the temperatures are 110, so I it's a nice thought, but I don't think anyone is banking on COVID-19 going away in the summertime. Um, this is, uh, I've included a picture of Dr. Wen Yang, who was um, one of the first uh, whistleblowers early in the pandemic, who tried to alert his colleagues and that there was a, a potential outbreak and was sadly silenced by the Chinese authorities and then ended up dying in hospital. Um, and his death triggered a, a sort of howls of outrage across China and a real pushback against the kinds of um, uh, authoritarian measures that the Chinese government had been taking. Uh, in early, sorry, in, in mid-February, uh, the WHO said that a vaccine would probably not be ready for at least 18 months. And as far as I know, that estimate has not changed. Um, the vaccine, vaccines will be developed, but are going to take some time. Uh, and the CDC announced that the, the testing kit that they had been developing and had sent out to public health labs around the country, including to ours, uh, unfortunately didn't work. There was an issue with uh, one of the three reagents that was used, and that set back our testing capabilities in the US quite significantly. So just to talk a little bit about the tests that we have, um, the ones that we have and the ones that we don't. Um, let's see, so these are the types of tests that are currently available. The lab-based PCR or the NAAT assay is the one that uh, uh, our public health lab has been using and that commercial labs have been offering for a while now. Um, these are lab-based tests. Um, right now they are the, the gold standard for diagnosis. Um, the uh, POC or point of care NAAT assay is uh, it's the same molecular technology as that first PCR test. Uh, this is just being rolled out now. Abbott and I believe Cepheid have tests. And these are tests that can be done like right in a clinic, or right in an emergency room, and they take uh, less than an hour, sometimes less than 15 minutes to get a result. Um, we have several of these machines now, and we're trying to um, we're looking at ways to deploy them around the state in areas where it would make the most sense to be able to get a rapid answer. Um, but the, the problem with those is that, uh, again, it's a supply issue. The, the testing has to be done with these little test cartridges. And uh, when they first sent out the machines, they only sent uh, 100 cartridges. 
We've been trying to get more, but again, everyone is trying to get their hands on the same supplies, so it's difficult. So, um, so we have the machines, but the testing supplies are the problem. Um, I have not seen any antigen testing being developed yet. These we've used these in flu, and they're they're an issue in terms of sensitivity. The sensitivity is lower with those. Um, I don't know how much utility those would be if they were developed. Um, and then finally, we have the serology tests um, or the antibody tests, and uh, these are being. Uh, lots of companies have rolled out their version of serological uh, tests. Um, one of them has uh, been approved by the FDA under an emergency use authorization. It means it can only be done in a lab. Um, but lots of other companies are touting um, their test um, and trying to sell it to different healthcare systems and healthcare facilities. And the problem with those tests is that it's very difficult to know how to use them. Um, they're not of much use in diagnosing acute infection because IgM antibody takes, takes um, probably at least four to five days to become detectable. Uh, so a, a negative test, especially early on, is not going to rule out COVID-19. And then we don't know how long antibodies persist. So you may pick up a, if you do, someone is positive for IgG, uh, maybe a couple of, uh, a month or two after their um, infection, and the temptation would be to say, well, that means you're immune. The thing is, we don't know that. You know, we do think that there is likely some degree of protective immunity after infection, but we don't know whether that lasts for a month or for a year or for longer than that, and whether it would be the same in different populations like older folks versus children. Um, I think the best use of these antibody tests right now would probably be in seroprevalence studies, and we're doing some of those with the CDC, or trying to identify um, people who um, could donate plasma to be used in clinical trials. Um, we'll skip over this a little. I wanted to talk a little bit, I'm just conscious of time. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the mode of transmission because this has been, um, this has been a hot topic and because of the shortages of PPE and there's a lot of differing um, opinions, expert opinion on this. So um, when we think about routes of transmission for respiratory infections, we think about droplet versus airborne. And we've tended to think of these as kind of binary, that you're either one or the other. Um, and that may not necessarily be the case. Droplet transmission is when you cough or sneeze and large droplets get sort of sprayed out into the air. And they may hang in the air for a few minutes and then drop to the floor. Uh, airborne transmission is when you get wider dissemination of these much smaller droplets that can hang in the air, maybe for several hours, and then be breathed in by somebody entering the room. So based on um, experience with SARS and MERS, we have a lot of data about this from the SARS outbreak. Um, as well as looking at what China's experience with COVID-19, it, uh, it looks like the primary route for SARS-CoV-2 is droplet um, and also possibly contact, which is where you have infectious droplets that are sitting on surfaces and you touch it and then touch your eyes or your, your face um, and bring it to your mucous membranes and get infected. But, uh, but one issue that's been discussed is whether you might have close range aerosol generation um, uh, nearer to the patient. So you have, you might have sort of a mixture of droplet and airborne. So I'm just going to show you some, these are some pictures from the um, SIDRAP website, which kind of illustrate this nicely. There's um, on the left there, you've got the infectious person A who uh, sneezes or coughs or perhaps is just talking um, and exhales this mixture of large and small droplets. And the person B who's within say three feet of the person um, is kind of sprayed with these various sizes of droplets and maybe inhales some of the droplet particles. But person C, who's over on the right, has no exposure. And then over time, the aerosols start to disperse and you get a mixture again of larger droplets, which are closer to the person, and then these smaller droplets, which start to waft their way over toward person C. 
And then after, some, after a longer period of time, the droplets have all fallen to the floor and then there may be some smaller aerosol particles circulating in the air. So this is one kind of idea for what might be happening in a room when you've got somebody with SARS-CoV-2 who's coughing or sneezing. Um, what we do know is that there are certain medical procedures that are deemed aerosol generating that do have a higher risk for generating um, uh, droplets that can then become aerosolized and diffuse more widely. And so the recommendation has been for healthcare workers uh, to try to reserve uh, personal protective equipment specifically for those aerosol generating procedures if possible. And this is what CDC is currently recommending and what we are doing where you've got um, an N95 respirator with um, a face shield which is designed to protect your eyes and then gown and gloves. And this would be the preferred, if we had all the PPE in the world, this is what we would recommend. I think for every seeing every person with uh, SARS-CoV-2, while there's some degree of uncertainty, but um, since we don't live in that world and we do have some good data that uh, face mask and N95 are equivalent when it comes to SARS, influenza, and likely SARS-CoV-2, this is sort of the acceptable alternative healthcare workers would use a face mask for more routine care. And uh, there has been some confusion, especially recently with the CDC's recommendations about cloth masks or homemade masks for wearing uh, for members of the public. And it's important to make the distinction between uh, source control and PPE. So a homemade mask is designed to reduce the risk to people around you. So if you happen to be infectious, wearing this mask will block at least the larger droplets from spraying out around you and infecting other people, but they're not designed to protect you from infection from other people. Whereas surgical masks or N95s are designed not to protect other people, they're specifically designed to, infect, to protect you, which is why they are supposed to be reserved for healthcare workers. Um, I think I will skip over this a little. Um, beginning of March was when uh, cases began exploding in Italy. And uh, I think this was when the stock market also started to, uh, started to crash. And then finally in mid-March, WHO finally declared a pandemic. And at this point, cases were up to 118,000. We had 1,272 cases in the US and 38 deaths. Um, in the Trump administration, we're still talking about travel bans, but I'm really not sure that this made any difference um, at this point. So how are things going here in Minnesota? So we started testing um, on January 20th using, uh, using a modified uh, CDC test kit. Um, I believe we're now using our own. Uh, we had our first confirmed case um, on March 6th, and it was a patient who had returned from a cruise on a ship that uh, ended up later having uh, had a known case and he um, uh, presumably came in contact with this person and developed symptoms after he got home. He had gotten off the ship before um, a, a SARS-CoV-2 case was identified on the ship, but he actually had been, uh, when he got home um, and read about there being a case on the, the ship, he actually, uh, he quarantined himself, um, which made things a little easier for us in terms of contact tracing. Um, and then, you know, since then, our caseload has continued to go up, and I have more uh, accurate numbers over the next couple of slides. Um, as we all know, all the way through March, various measures were taken, like suspension of classes at the U, uh, state of emergency was declared by the governor, uh, schools closed, and then finally, um, the shelter in place order to close non essential businesses. Uh, which has now been extended uh, to, oh, I'm sorry, that should be May 3rd, not March 3rd. So this is our, if you go to the uh, MDH website, there's a situation update for COVID-19. And this is updated um, every morning at 11 o'clock. So this was, I took the graph from yesterday, I believe we have had about maybe 50 more cases since that, current, that number, so that's a little bit out of date. Um, in terms of deaths, uh, we have had 94. I, I think we've had at least three more um, as of this morning. Uh, a lot of our deaths have been 
residents of long-term care facilities um, who are particularly at risk during this pandemic. Uh, total numbers hospitalized, uh, or the cumulative number, I think we've had about 400 and 420, something like that in total. Right now, today we have 213 people hospitalized with COVID-19 across the state, including 103 who are in the ICU. Um, and this is our age distribution. And you can see, um, we have, interesting enough, we've had um, quite a lot in the 20 to 44 age group. Um, as well as the older age groups. You can see, um, consistent with how this pandemic has played out, we've seen very few cases in children, luckily. Um, and then our race and ethnicity breakdown. Um, we, you know, what we've, what's come out from um, other locations around the US is um, that there is a disparity in race between uh, the people that we're seeing with severe illness and people in the ICU, we're seeing a little bit of that here. Um, about 10% of our cases have been um, African American, whereas I believe in terms of population, uh, that's only about 6%. So there's a little bit of disparity there. Um, I believe they have been maybe 2% of the deaths. Um, and then in terms of how we're doing compared to other states, uh, this is COVID-19 cumulative mortality in uh, the top 10 states. And luckily, Minnesota is not in the top 10. Um, the highest has been New York. New Jersey is getting up there. Um, and we're seeing uh, places like Louisiana and Michigan starting to increase significantly as well. Um, but for Minnesota, um, these are our cases per 100,000 after the first 100 confirmed cases. Um, and this is a little bit out of date. This is from about a week ago. Um, the most recent version of this graph that I've seen, that uh, blue line kind of continues along a fairly kind of horizontal trajectory. So, um, so it does look like with our social distancing measures, um, we are kind of, we think, flattening that curve a little bit. And uh, this was uh, data released from uh, CDC looking at the cumulative incidents per state. Um, and for Minnesota, we're actually the lowest of all 50 states in terms of our cumulative incidents. So a colleague of mine here said either we're doing something very right or something very wrong. And I think we're doing something very right. Um, you know, you always worry whether you're, uh, you're simply not testing enough. Um, and that's definitely been an issue here. We haven't been able to test as many people as we would have liked, but you have issues like this in all 50 states. So at least when you look comparatively, it's nice to see that we're you know, toward the bottom of the pack. And then finally, um, this is uh, the Minnesota model. Um, the Minnesota COVID-19 model, this was developed as a collaboration between the School of Public Health and the Minnesota Department of Health. And the governor released this um, last week. And just to go through, um, this model is different from some of the other models that you might have seen, um, like the IHME model, which is out of Washington, which is a lot more optimistic. Um, this model does um, predict more cases and more deaths, um, but there are some significant differences between this model uh, and other models. Um, uh, these are the parameters that are being sort of plugged in for the parameters that are being used to calculate or make predictions in the model. Um, our available ICU beds is 2,200. Um, we have not hit that sort of surge yet. We still have plenty of ICU and ventilator capacity around the state. Um, we're hoping that um, as the pandemic progresses, that the, the entire goal is to try to keep those numbers down as much as possible. So. Um, and all of this is available on the governor's website. I'll, uh, I think I included a link to it at the end. So, and they do a very good, um, see all of the data. There's a very good um, uh, video presentation from Commissioner Malcolm and from the authors of the model, um, sort of describing where the data came from, what, they've, what they feel about the, uh, the predictions. But um, if you look down at scenario four, which is bolded, um, and this is where, um, this is where we are now, where we are extending the stay at home order until early May. Um, if you kind of follow that across, you can see that uh, this would mean that the predicted peak would be in July. And you can see there's fairly wide um, 
you know, estimates of uncertainty here, but um, hopefully we would be able to keep the um, ICU numbers, if you look at that kind of lower estimate of uncertainty, that it would be a little above what our current ICU capacity is. And from what I've from what I understand from the folks in surge planning, um, there are plans to be able to um, add at least 500 beds to the current capacity of 2,200. So if all goes well, I think we think that we, um, we should be able to manage in terms of our ICU capacity. But these models change. This is like version two, there will be a version three of the model, and it all just depends on uh, how things change with uh, what we're doing with businesses and schools and social distancing. And uh, uh, it's, it's a moving target, really. So these are just some links that I've included. Um, the Department of Health website has a really good um, COVID-19 section with lots of like, situation updates, like I said, and different resources for healthcare, for schools, things like that. CDC is a great website. Um, SIDRAP also has a ton of stuff on there. Um, Mike Osterholm does um, a podcast every week talking about the pandemic, which is, uh, which is quite interesting to listen to if you have the time. And then um, those are the, that's just the link there to the, the Minnesota model. So um, I think I've just gone a little bit over, but we have a few minutes. So I will stop and uh, take some questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lim. We do have quite a few questions here. Um, mm -hmm. So I will get to them as quickly as we can here. And I think you touched on this, but could you, um, in talking about the clinical features of COVID-19, how confident are we in the spectrum of illness percentages and case fatality rates reported given that mild cases or uncomplicated cases are not tested? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, we are not hugely confident. I think there's always been this, because we're so limited in the amount of testing that we can do, I don't think that we know for sure. Um, but the a lot of testing has been done in other countries, and that's where the, uh, that's in general where the, the, the initial estimates at least have come from. Um, obviously, you know, we don't know how many people are walking around out there um, with asymptomatic uh, illness because we can't test them. Um, but certainly when you look at the numbers who have severe disease and the numbers who are hospitalized in general, I think um, that those percentages we think are reasonably accurate. But yeah, you're right. It's, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those black boxes. Yeah. And so continuing in that same vein um, and talking about extrapolation, um, with influenza mortality rates, and we don't know the true denominator, where do we think COVID-19 fatality rates will fall in the end compared to influenza? So I think we think it is higher than influenza, um, but it, again, it depends a great deal on who you're looking at. Uh, and when you're looking at it. So I think the, the case fatality rate overall, we think is going to shake out at about 1%. Um, for seasonal influenza, it's about 0.1%. So obviously there's a big difference there, but one thing to remember when you're thinking of case fatality rates is that it, again, depends on the denominator. It depends on who you're testing. It depends on when in the pandemic you're testing. So case fatality rates are usually higher at the beginning of a pandemic because all you're seeing are the severe cases. And then it tends to drop as you get further out and you're testing more of the population. So, and it also depends a great deal on the age group that you fall into and your underlying comorbidities. So if you are in the ICU with respiratory failure, multi-organ failure, with, with critical illness secondary to COVID-19, uh, your mortality is about 50%, unfortunately. So it, you can see how it, it can vary, varies a lot depending on the setting and depending on when you're looking. Okay, a uh, couple of questions about testing. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the evidence that serology is an indication of protection? Or in other words, has antibody been demonstrated to protective or recovery cell mediated? And I think you kind of touched on that a little. Um, and are there reports that the most severe cases in people are caused by excessive inflammation response and overreaction by immune system? Okay, yep. Yeah. So, the, yeah, those are great questions. Um, so, the, the first one about um, immunity, 
So there have been um, there have been studies looking at infection models in uh, macaque monkeys, where monkeys have been um, exposed to SARS-CoV-2 and have developed illness and then developed antibody, but then been rechallenged. And so far, those results have been promising and that it does look like there is some degree of protective immunity. Um, obviously, these kinds of studies would be unethical to do in humans. Um, so, and in thinking back to other coronaviruses, um, for the milder common cold type coronaviruses, there, uh, there is uh, some type of protective immunity as well. Um, you, once you've been ill with one particular strain, you often do have immunity to that particular strain for perhaps up to a year. So whether or not that can be extrapolated to SARS-CoV-2 obviously is an open question. Um, we, we simply don't know how much immunity people do have. Um, the virus has only been you know, known to science for about three months. So, uh, and again, I don't know how different it might be depending on different populations. And then um, your other, oh yeah, the other question was about um, the inflammatory response. Um, and yes, so what we've seen in people who are hospitalized is that there are, there are some laboratory markers of a major inflammatory response, uh, interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein and some other ones um, seem to, um, they go up and in some cases they've been a marker or a predictor of people having more severe illness and maybe crashing and deteriorating uh, quickly. So this is why people have started looking at the immune modulating drugs like, on which I can never say, but poculizumab, um, and I think at least one or two others, um, and using them as potential therapeutics. So um, that's, again, that's kind of still kind of an open question, but there's, um, uh, there are a lot of studies going on trying to answer that question. Yes, and so I, I think the same is kind of true of this question. We're talking about specificity and sensitivity of the various tests, false positives, false negatives. Um, do we know how reliable the various tests are? So I think for the, and you know, sensitivity and specificity is always dependent on the prevalence in the population that you're testing. Um, but generally we've been testing, at least here right now, we're, we're generally testing pretty high risk patients. So um, the, for the PCR testing, the sensitivity and specificity are thought to be quite high. I mean, I believe well into the 90% range. Uh, the point of care test where you're doing a similar PCR molecular based test, but, you know, on a, on a more rapid um, time scale, um, there has been a question about whether the sensitivity may be lower than with the lab based PCR. So we are actually um, starting some validation studies now to see whether um, that is going to play out. Um, the sensitivity is probably still reasonably high, but probably just won't be quite as high as the lab based. Uh, and then for the serological testing, I think, you know, I'm not too sure. Lots of companies are kind of touting their test as being 100% sensitive and 100% specific. Um, you know, the, the more reputable companies um, do have sensitivity specificity estimates that are, you know, 93, 95%. But, you know, again, for these tests, it really depends on uh, when you're testing and what you're hoping to do with the information. And serological testing using IgM and IgG in general with infectious diseases is always difficult. I mean, we've, we do it for Lyme disease, we do it for HIV testing, we do it for a lot of different things. And there's always the issue of false negatives when you test early, um, and then having positive tests kind of further on in the course of illness, but not really knowing what that means or what are you planning to do with it. So. Um, the other point that I'll make about the, um, the serological testing is that um, the FDA have been warning um, about uh, fraud, that there are uh, companies or vendors who are selling products that are, are actually not testing kits, or um, uh, if you're online, they're actually linking to uh, malware. So they've actually kept, they have a list up on their website of the, uh, the companies that they they know um, have developed tests, so you can if you get an offer that sort of seems too good to be true. You can check it against this list of businesses to see if they're on the list. But you know, none of them 
none of them have been validated by the FDA. And you know, only one of them has this emergency use authorization, but that's it. So there is um, there's a multidisciplinary group involving the CDC, the NIH, the FDA that have been tasked with looking at, at all of these tests and validating them and then coming up with guidance of uh, which one might be better and in what way we could use serological testing. Um, again, I think, uh, I'm not sure what role it plays at this point in the pandemic, but it's definitely going to be important for determining things like seroprevalence within the population and so on. Um, I, I hope you have a few more minutes because we have just a couple more questions that are very yeah. similar. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. So the question is really about, and I know you're a human doctor, not a uh, veterinarian, <laughs> um, but the question is talking about transmission between uh, humans and pets and pets and humans. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I Well, again, actually, you all would probably know a little bit more than me about this. Um, I was reading about the, um, the tiger in the Bronx. Um, being tested for SARS-CoV-2 and being positive. Um, my understanding from what I read is that if there's any um, if there's any transmission going on between um, pets and, and humans, like, like right now in this pandemic with, with, with the virus that we have now, that, that it's human to pet and it's not pet to human. So, um, and exactly where, what types of animals might be susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, I'm not sure. Um, you know, again, you all would know more about coronaviruses in, in animals um, than I would. But I think if you have, if you've had um, patients who are worried about, you know, whether or not their cat might be infectious or something like that, I, I think I would tell them not to worry. I don't, I don't think we should be socially isolating from our pets at this point. Great. Thank you very much. Those are all our questions. Um, and I've got a lot of comments from uh, our attendees saying thank you to you too. Um, so Dr. Lim, we greatly appreciate your time and expertise. You're and welcome. have a great day. Thank you. Bye.